Welcome back to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. We're pleased to welcome Carlos Alberto Montaner, one of Cuba's most well-known and respected authors of 29 books and thousands of articles, mostly on the Cuban dictatorship and Latin American politics. Carlos, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bill. It's such an honor and pleasure to meet you down here at the Antigua Forum Conference. I read your book, The History of Cuba in One Lesson on the Plain Down, hoping I'd have a chance to talk to you about it. I ask you on the show to take us through modern Cuban history. But before we do, tell us a little bit about yourself. As a writer and a journalist, you were jailed by the Castros on false charges of being a CIA agent. When was that? And tell us about that. Well, at that time, I was 17 years old, December 1960. Mm. And we were a group of uh, students trying to avoid the uh, creation in Cuba of a communist uh, dictatorship. And really, we were doing nothing, but we were accused as uh, CIA Mm -hmm. agents and terrorists, and they condemned me and uh, the others to 20 years of uh, of 20 years of prison. How did you escape? I escaped because I I was uh, 17 years old. I was put in a special jail for political prisoners that were under 18 18 years old. Ah. The youngest was 11 years old. An 11-year-old political prisoner? Yes. Was he a hostage for his parents? No, he was was a very interesting case. His father was being shot by a squad. uh, Mm, Firing squad? Fire squad. And um, he was burning cañaverales, uh, sugar cane, mm-hmm. because um, that was he, he, he his, would, protest. He, he, his form of protest. And it was very difficult for the police to, to see w- what was happening, mm-hmm. because uh, this young boy acted, of course, alone, mm-hmm. because he was an 11, 11 years, years old. old. Was, sure. was very, but he was angry about his father being murdered. Exactly, exactly. And then he started doing what he know how to do. Sure. I don't know if he was condemned or not, but he was there. Was he able to escape with you, or did no, you get no, out no, on your no, own? No, no, no. We were around 50 or 60 in that particular cell, and we escaped two. Two? Two person. A guy who, uh, he was a farmer, Rafael Gerada, that was his name. He escaped from with me, and um, we took asylum in an embassy in Havana. Ah, so that's how you got out of the country. Exactly. We were seven months until we get the uh, safe conducts to get out of the country. So, Carlos, your history of Cuba going back to Columbus was fascinating, but let's, let's start with the Bay of Pigs. This is something that's seared into the Americans' memory, a fiasco during the Kennedy administration. What was the impact of the invasion on the Cuban people and on giving Fidel Castro an opportunity now to create the great enemy in the North? Well, he was decided. This is something that I knew uh, after many years, but he was decided to create a communist regime in Cuba since the day one. He chose the Americans as the enemy since he was at the Sierra Maestra fighting against Batista. There is a letter by Fidel Castro in 1958. He took power in 1959. A letter written to, at that time he was uh, his lover, mm-hmm. and he wrote, my main task in life would be to fight against the Americans. That was something that he decided uh, many years ago. He was a communist. Uh, we didn't know. We should, but we, we didn't know. He hid very well. His, his intentions. His intentions. But after the Bay of Pigs, there was no question now. We exactly. were mortal enemies. I, I was in Cuba during the Bay of Pigs. I was, uh, in, a, I was in the embassy. Mm-hmm. I was uh, protected by the embassy. And we thought that the uh, invasion will, will win. We were very close to get out from the embassy, mm-hmm. to try to add ourselves to the uh, invasors. But we couldn't. Of course, the, we couldn't because I think this was defeated in 24 hours. Yeah, you're lucky. Actually, we were lucky. <laughs> we were lucky, happen. exactly. Well, you know, when Castro came to power, he envisioned the new communist man, and he claimed that within a decade, Cuba would catch up with the United States in its economy. Did the people believe him? 
people believe uh, anything. And it, I remember that Fidel said that and Che Guevara mm-hmm. said that also, that in 10 years, Cuba will be at the same level of economic level of the United States. And they were absolutely not just crazy, they were ignorant, very ignorant of how you create wealth and how you maintain wealth and how you preserve. But some people believe it. And also, for him, it was easy to create some kind of, a, how you say it, clientele? Mm-hmm. Clients. Uh, clients. Political clients. Political clients. He did it with the money of uh, his enemies. The first thing he did when he arrived to Havana was to reduce the amount of people paid uh, the rent, the, the, the monthly rent. To landlords. The land, to yeah, landlords. Sure. 50%. What's more popular than that? <laughs> no, of course. 80% of the people were Our renters, not landlords. renters, of course. Yeah, they still do that in big cities in the United States. <laughs> they do that. <laughs> it's called rent control. Yeah. <laughs> but he was smart about that. But there was a violent side. Tell us about the committees for the defense of the revolution and the forced labor camps. Well, that was the uh, creation of the, of the Soviet advisors that start coming to Cuba in 1959. Mm-hmm. The date is interesting. The exact uh, date where Ike Eisenhower signed the order to try to overthrow the Castro regime was uh, March 1960. One week before arrived in Cuba the Soviet general Francisco Ciutat. Hmm. He was uh, from Hispanic origin, but he was a, a, a general of, of the Soviet army. And his uh, main task was to create a satellite and to create a, a police state. They know how to do it because they did it in Europe after the Second World. They were experts mm-hmm. in how to build police states. How to build police state. And that's when in 1962 there were 40,000 Soviet Personnel, personnel on the island on the island creating the police state apparatus one of castro's big programs was really becoming the terrorist center in the western hemisphere exactly. they called it exporting the revolution mm-hmm. che guevara was on the front lines of that it's much like isis today exactly tell us about that well they even create some kind of international uh, doctrine mm-hmm. they said that uh, the main task of the revolutionary people in the world was to make uh, revolutions mm. and they they have the right to do it and they create in Havana the tricontinental tricontinental with people from Africa Asia and, right. and America and of course Europe too, at the same time in order to subvert the political systems in all around the world they even try to do it in, in the United States they were very close to the Black Panthers, mm-hmm. to the independentistas in Puerto Rico. And Nicaragua, Angola. I mean, it was a major international campaign. F- financed by who? By Soviet Union and, and also by committing extortions and um, ransoms. I remember Bor was a very important family in Argentina, in Argentina. They get it from that family sixty-two million dollars extortion. Extortion in order not to kill the Boer for, uh, brothers that were kidnapped by. They did every, every kind of uh, of things, and because they were fighting the last and final war against the United States, against the West, against uh, capitalism. capitalism, that was he was in, in his mind. It's messianic mission. Absolutely messianic. Probably the most famous mass murderer to come out of that was Che Guevara. I have to ask you, how do you explain Che Guevara's lasting fame on American college campuses? And all around the world, it's incredible because he was, as you said, a mass murderer. And he's some, someone who said things uh, horrible like, the main task of a good revolutionary is to kill his enemies. And he believed in that. The image is very powerful. The the photograph yeah sure taken by still on t-shirts <laughs> he's in all t-shirts and also is some kind of a gesture to demonstrate that you are a rebel sure teenage rebellious uh, exactly exactly sometimes the students do not 
know who this guy was. Mm. They they think that he was a singer or a rock and roll star or something. I don't know. But he was a sinister person and direct responsible for a lot of killings in Cuba in the in 1959. Mm -hmm. He was in charge of La Cabaña, who was a military fortress that was a prison. Mm -hmm. And uh, he killed dozens of, of those, probably 200 people that were killed under his responsibility, practically without any kind of uh, of trial. Carlos, when we look at the Cuban Revolution, I want to wind us back to some of the economic consequences. Early on, Castro shut down all small businesses, all entrepreneurs, and expropriated property and businesses for the state. What was the impact on the local Cuban economy? Well, that destroyed the Cuban economy. There was a mate in two sequence. First, in 1961, he chased all the medium and big enterprise and confiscate all the properties. In 1968, he confiscated the rest of uh, all kind of private property. Every small shop, restaurant, exactly. taxi it, driver, you it, name it. Exactly, absolutely. Cuba was the most communist state in the world. At that time, Hungary was trying to get out from collectivism and trying to implement some kind of uh, measures mm -hmm. against collectivism, but Cuba was in, in the other way around, exactly in the other way around. I remember that in the, in the 60s, the, uh, the first consequence of that stupid measure was a very big inflation. Sure. The destroy of the production, there was no production in Cuba. And that last until 1970, mm -hmm. because in 1970, the Cuban economy practically collapsed. And at least they try to be like the Soviets. Mm -hmm. They copied the Soviet model. But Fidel Castro was not happy with the outcomes. And during the 70s was the Sovietization of the island. At that time, Cuba launched an invasion to Angola mm -hmm. and to Ethiopia. Instead of a group of guerrillas trying to overthrow the government, he used his army with the back, of course, of the Soviet Union, financing the and helping in some ways. But he was more aggressive even than the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union used Cuba in 1962 for trying to place the oh, missiles, sure, the Cuban missile crisis. <coughs> Cuba missile crisis. But Castro was more aggressive than that. I remember that he, he told uh, a friend of mine who was an historian from Venezuela, Guillermo Morón, that was his name, he told in 1979 that he was sure that eventually he will see himself walking through Washington with the uh, United States absolutely controlled by the leftists. And yet at one point the Cuban economy had gotten so bad and the currency had collapsed in inflation, they were forced to dollarize. That was after the 90s, but just for a short period. For three or four years after the disappearance of the Soviet Union, right. the, the uh, subsidy that the came for... Kept them going. Exactly. No one disappe disappeared, practically disappeared during the Yeltsin uh, regime. Mm -hmm. And uh, suddenly, Cuban economy collapsed again. And he had to resort to some, some kind of market economy or some kind of, basically not market economy, because that was not true, investment from Western companies that were trying to, to make some money in, 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 that, uh, in that particular regime, which was very naive because uh, it's very difficult to make money in a country like that. There's no rule of law, there's no uh, independent judiciary. Sure. You cannot solve any, any kind of problem. And people make really, if you change to dollars, they, they are really, really making $10 a month or something like that. Right now, right now, after many years, after the Soviet Union disappeared, the salary of the Cubans is uh, the equivalent of $24 a month. 
the level of desperation of the Cuban people is well known. And I have to ask you, as an American with friends whose family fled Cuba, my image of the Cuban people are tremendous bravery to risk their lives to leave the country, to risk their lives to cross the water to get to the United States, to come here with nothing but the clothes on their back, build businesses, build families, with such bravery in the country's character. How is it possible that Castro lasted so long and no one put a bullet in his head? Well, some people try, but they, they fail, and um, they were put in jail or they were shot. And uh, the system is practically indestructible from the point of view of the, of the opposition. You cannot destroy that type of regime from outside. Those uh, regimes depends on counterintelligence. They use the 0.5% of the population as a counterintelligence professional agents. That means that 60,000 people in Cuba are spying on everybody. Exactly. 60,000. No, th this is the, the hardcore. There are more than that. 60,000 are the professionals, the officers okay. of the counterintelligence. That number was learned from the Stasi. That was the Stasi. Oh, the Stasi files. And the, the Stasi uses the same 0.5%. That was uh, probably close to 100,000 people because the population in East Germany, in Germany was, uh, was bigger. And that's enough to control everything because what they are trying to control is that you never do anything that could harm the uh, stability of the of the regime. In that sense, is uh, is uh, absolutely in the indestructible. Many Americans, particularly Cuban Americans, were surprised that Obama reached for a rapprochement with Cuba before the Castros died. We're now in an interesting new phase of our relationship with them. American Airlines is beginning to fly to Havana. Many people want to see the country. Oddly enough, they want to see the country before it changes, which I find curious. What do you see in the near term with the opening, but before the Castros die? No, nothing will happen. I mean, the Cuban government is looking uh, at uh, Washington with a uh, surprise because the issues, the Americans were their enemies since the 50s and they remain the enemies of, uh, of the Cuban government, and suddenly the U.S. government decide that, that they are friends. Mm. And that's very surprising for, for the Cuban government and for a, a most of the part for the rest of the, of the Cubans. I think Obama is very naive because he doesn't perceive that the Cold War end in practically every place, but not in all places. Mm. The Cold War didn't finish in North Korea, didn't finish in Cuba. Cubans were trying immediately after the disappearance of the uh, Soviet Union, they were trying to create, with the same uh, knowledge that they got from, from the Soviet Union, they tried to create an apparatus to go against the uh, Americans. Mm -hmm. They created Foro de Sao Paulo. Foro de Sao Paulo was a reunion of all the organizations, communist organizations, terrorist organizations, some from the Islamic world, some from uh, Colombia, FARC, for yeah, example, the, yeah. the Colombians, uh, the FARC, and all the communist party of Latin America. They create that international movement. They call Foro de Sao Paulo to try to keep the fighting against uh, imperialism, American sure, imperialism. Keep the revolution alive. Keep the revolution alive, okay. That was in the beginning of the 90s. At the end of the 90s, Hugo Chavez came to power. Fidel Castro seduced and uh, convinced mm. Hugo Chavez that he must use the uh, petrodollars to pay for the revolution. And of course, now we've turned Venezuela into the international basket case. Exactly. And also, there is a, a myth that they are not the enemies. They are Venezuelans or Cubans. They are not a danger anymore. That's absolutely ridiculous. They are trying to do as much harm as they can 
to the Americans, to the Western world, to the capitalism, well, to, the, the, to the market. Exactly. So, Carlos, give us your forecast for the future of Cuba after the Castros die. Well, after the Castros die, I suppose that it will be a, an evolution to common sense and to democracy. The same that what we saw in Eastern Europe, more or less the same thing. Because Cubans are very tired of the system after close to 60 years, yeah. 57 years. I mean, right. that's a, a, lot, a lot of time. And I think they want to end with that, uh, with that system. They don't know exactly what it means, what it means and, and what to expect of the future. But they know that what they have it is absolutely wrong. And we will see changes and we will see at the in the first in the beginning we will see a, a lot of people trying to 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 flee, to flee from sure. from Cuba the same thing that we are seeing in the last uh, 57 years with Mariel with the, the lot of uh, right. and we will see that again but eventually everything will settle down remember that the Cuba was was not a migrant country Mm, sure. Before 1959. There were more Americans living in Cuba than Cuba living in America bef before 1959. Interesting. They even have, uh, we have even two papers in English and mm -hmm. and very many Americans were, why was at least many Americans for this small amount mm -hmm. of, of the population of Cuba? But because uh, there was a, a, a land with a lot of economic problems or with a lot of political problems but with opportunities right and i think people see those opportunities exactly, again exactly carlos it was an honor and a pleasure to meet you thank you so much for being on the show thank you bill thank you for inviting me that was carlos alberto montaner author of journey to the heart of cuba and guide to the perfect latin american idiot here on real clear radio hour brought to you by the competitive enterprise institute i'm your host bill frezza Real Clear Radio Hour is produced in conjunction with Real Clear Politics, America's premier independent political website. You can check out Real Clear Radio on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Real Clear Fresa. We'd also like to welcome our newest listeners from KATE 1450 AM, just south of Minneapolis, Minnesota. That wraps up our show for this week. Please join us next week, same time, same station. See you then. See you then.